Welcome to the Peter King Podcast. So happy you can join us. Uh, Miles Simmons and I, my partner from NBC Sports, for another edition of the podcast. We're also going to be joined a little bit later in the pod by Sal Palantonio of ESPN, my buddy on the Hall of Fame committee, my buddy for years covering the National Football League. And we're going to discuss the strange case of the Philadelphia Eagles. We'll get into the Jets a little bit. We're even going to get into all the president's men for all of you movie buffs. So anyway, we'll have a good discussion with Sal later in the podcast. I'm going to bring on Miles Simmons now. We're going to discuss the Monday night football game at SoFi Stadium. Dallas 20, uh, the Chargers 17. Miles was in the house. So he's got some opinions on this. We're also going to get to, in this podcast, uh, I came away from Sunday, the more I thought about it, really thinking a lot about clock management at the ends of games. And there's one particular bit of clock management at the end of the Philadelphia Jets game that really bothered me then, and it bothers me right now, even a couple of days later. Um, The other things we're going to get to on the pod, no more unbeatens uh, in the NFL this year. Why is that after six weeks? Why is it that everyone uh, has had a Sunday that they would like to take back, you know, that they would like to have over again? We're going to talk about the Bills problems. We're going to talk about San Francisco's problems. Uh, that, you know, the injury bug, you always know that a physical football team over a 17-week period is going to start to get chipped up. And that's what's going on with the Niners. We'll talk about that a bit. We're going to talk about Deshaun Watson and where the Cleveland Browns are. Hey, listen, great win for the Browns. Loved it. Uh, Good for them. But let's not be lulled into thinking that they can contend with an offense that, whew, I mean, clearly they're playing a good team in the 49ers and a good defense, but I I don't know if they're going to be good enough on offense to be able to sustain this. And uh, obviously they got a big, big, big break with a 41-yard missed field goal by the Niners rookie kicker, Jake Moody. We're going to get into all that. uh, But first, so Miles Simmons, you were on board. You were in the stadium at SoFi. You saw... Dallas nipping the Chargers. So give me a couple of takeaways that you found when you were at that game last night. Well, first of all, Peter, it was the most unique press box experience I've ever had because I don't know if you saw this on social media, but the Cowboys Spanish radio broadcast team was in the writer section of the press box for some reason. I mean, obviously wow. it's a Monday night game. They've got alternate feeds. They're doing so. I, so I don't know if there were just one too few booths or whatever, but I've got Spanish radio really buzzing in my ear throughout the entire game. So <laughs> that was weird, wow. you know, and on maybe 150 games I've covered in person. I've never had something like that happen over the course of 10 years. So that was weird, but I think when you look at these two teams, and I was texting some buddies about this, these are like mid teams. They're a little bit above average. I think if we look at the Cowboys, yeah, they're above average, but the Chargers are average. And when you have a team that has higher aspirations than this, and you've paid your quarterback to be great, right? And I don't think there's any dispute that, Justin Herbert can be great, but he was not great last night. I mean, there were wide open throws, especially one in the second half down the left sideline to Keenan Allen. I mean, that's a layup for that guy. And he missed it for whatever reason. You know, the Cowboys pressure certainly was a factor throughout the game. They got Herbert off of his spot. He was able to break contain and roll to his right so many times that I almost didn't understand what the hell the Cowboys were doing on defense, but When you miss a throw like that, that is supposed to be routine for somebody who is making as much money as Justin Herbert's making, that's an issue. And I don't think, and I'm not saying that to say that Justin Herbert's not clutch. Justin Herbert can't do this. Justin Herbert can't do that. But if we look at the isolation of the Monday night game, 
Justin Herbert did not perform up to his standard, and that is a big reason why the Chargers lost. Yeah, I I was a little bit bothered by Justin Herbert, and I keep wondering, you know, is Justin Herbert fully healthy? Um, mm-hmm. That's was one of my big questions coming out of that game last night. Um, he looked. Uh, he looked not like a great quarterback. He looked like a mid-tier quarterback. He looked like the 15th quarterback in the NFL. It bothered me last night because if he played very well in this game, look, hand it to the Charger defense. You know, they hung in there in this game. And now it looks like, you know, they, it, it, maybe it isn't just one week when, say, the Khalil Mack experience sort of blows up and and they kill the Raiders. It isn't just one week that they can really look good on defense. They might be able to have more of an answer on defense than they have had in the previous two years of Brandon Staley. The one thing about the Cowboys that interests me about this game is that, you know, Dak Prescott, after the game, called it a must-win. He may mm-hmm. have called it that during the week. I don't know. But he called it a must-win. Everybody said, what are you talking about? They would have been 3-3 three and three in a weak NFC, and they still would have been fine. Here's the whole point. There are some times in a season where you simply have got to stop the bleeding, no matter mm-hmm. how you do it. And last night was one of those times. I'm sure that, you know, on Sunday night after the San Francisco debacle, after you lose by 32 in a game that you've been pointing to throughout the offseason, and you lose that by 32 and you look awful, you get on the plane from San Jose back to Dallas, you got a nice three-hour flight to think about how awful things are, and you say, this, we have got to draw a line in the sand. If we think we're a really good team, we must win <coughs> on our next trip to California in six days. That's what that was about. And I happen to agree with Dak Prescott. Now, I applaud Prescott for playing differently in this game. Uh, he ran the ball. He had the longest run of his career for a touchdown in the first half. Uh, he looked to be a little bit more mobile And I thought that that's the one thing that the Dallas quarterback needs to do going forward, be a little bit more mobile. But still, that was a very, very C-plus at best performance by the Dallas offense. And Miles, I thought you hit it right on the head. These are two teams that look to be in the great middle of the NFL. And if Dallas is going to play one very good team and get killed and play one team in the middle and have to just barely survive to win the game and pick off a ball in the last 90 seconds. I I mean, the people who think that Dallas are going to the Super Bowl, Dallas is going to the Super Bowl, um, they're going to have to do a lot better in the next six, seven weeks to get up to that level. Uh, Oops, I I was one of those people that picked up to go to the Super Bowl, which maybe I shouldn't admit right at this moment, but I did it. Um, And yeah, I don't necessarily feel really great about that pick right now. I mean, I, I... I look at Dak Prescott and I have such respect for his work and what he's done to make himself the kind of player that he is. But then I watch the games and I'm like, man, oh man, oh man. Like part of it, I think is scheme too, because if you look around at teams with great receivers, you know, I mean, Tyreek Hill is playing on another level right now, but I mean, even if it's LA and you're talking about Cooper cup, right. Or you're talking about a Justin Jefferson with Minnesota. I mean, there are teams that scheme for their best receiver. And I just feel like I'm looking at the Cowboys offense and they need to scheme more for 88 because CD lamb is reminding yeah. me right now of what Jamar Chase was saying. He's always bleeping open. Like last night, watching the game from the angle yeah. that I did in that press box, C.D. Lamb more times than not was open. And sometimes just Prescott wasn't looking for him. Yes, yeah, sometimes the Chargers were rolling coverages over to him. But the best teams and the best offensive schemers, they organize and have plans for their best players. And when somebody catches all seven of their targets for 117 yards, that to me signals that he needed three to five more targets because 
at a certain point, you have to say, look, this is our best player. And I understand that Tony Pollard is open in the end zone on that wheel route. But if it's third and 10 and I'm having my quarterback throw, who would I really rather have try to catch the ball? The running back or the best receiver on the team? There are ways to get that guy open. And that's one thing that I think the Cowboys have to look at going forward is how do we create plays for number 88? Because that's what the best teams do. They, They scheme it for their best players. Miles, uh, you know, the one other quick thing about the Chargers I wanted to say is that, you know, every one of their games this year has been decided by a touchdown or less. You know, so at this point of the season, their games have been decided by two, three, three, four, and seven. I might be missing one there, but you know, every single game decided by a touchdown or less. If you're a good team, you win some of those games. And right now, as we said, the Chargers are in the great middle and they need their quarterback to lift them on days like Monday night. He didn't. And so now you look at the Chargers going forward. They got the Chiefs twice, even though they've beaten the Chiefs a couple of times in recent years. Uh, they now have lost to him, I think, three times in a row. And they, it, for the Chargers to be a good team this year, I know this is going to sound crazy. You know, they're going to have to split with uh, Kansas City. And if they don't split with Kansas City, you know, in the immortal words of Dak Prescott, they got a bunch of must wins the rest of the way. So we shall see. You know, there's one other thing I want to talk about before we get to a break. And that is clock management in the National Football League. Okay, so I have been thinking this a lot during the course of the early season, and it crystallized. In fact, if my Sunday nights weren't such a fire drill where I'm trying to cover everything, and I always think about this, should I try to cover everything or should I really focus on the things that slap me in the face a little bit more than I do. And I'm kicking myself now because when I woke up Monday morning, I said, you know, the one thing I didn't write about that I really thought that I should write about is Nick Sirianni's decision at the end of the Eagles-Jets game. Now, Miles, I'm going to give you the situation. And I want our listeners to hear this situation, okay? The Philadelphia Eagles all day had played a mostly suffocating defense against the Jets. They had given up 12 points, and here we are at the two-minute warning, and here's the situation. The Eagles have a third and nine at the two-minute warning. They're ahead 14 to 12. So you're at the two-minute warning. You're ahead 14 to 12, And you have a choice. Are we either going to throw to try to make the first down and then run out the clock? Or because the Jets have no timeouts left. So now it's impossible for the Jets to uh, stop the clock. The two-minute warning is gone. Their three timeouts are gone. It's third and nine. Two minutes left in the second half. So... What Nick Sirianni decides to do is he decides to throw for it on a day that Jalen Hurts was having a very frustrating day against the New York Jets. They throw for it. And if you see the end zone replay uh, that, uh, that Fox showed, I think it was Fox. If you see the end zone replay that Fox showed, you're absolutely amazed that Jalen Hurts threw this ball. A Mm -hmm. gigantic mistake. He had his own receiver bracketed by two Jets. Okay, on the right was Tony Adams. And it was actually a very simple interception. Mm -hmm. And, And I don't want to get into all the X's and O's because I think the Jets scouted this play very, very well. 
uh, what they might do in third and long. But be that as it may, Nick Sirianni chose to throw for this, and then if they if that pass is complete, game's over. They mm-hmm. just get to uh, – clock can't be stopped from there. They run a couple more plays, game's over. However, let's look at the alternative. Let's say what happens if you run uh, – you know – if you if you run on third down and you come up three yards short of the first down. So now let's just say you're punting at midfield and you basically can let the clock run all the way down. So if you're running, if you run at midfield, the clock then at the end of that play, there'd be a minute 53, let's say. So you got a minute 53 and then 40 seconds are going to come off the clock. So, and then whether the Eagles then take a timeout right before they have to punt, which probably they would do, whatever happens, the Eagles are going to punt the ball and the Jets are going to get the ball, I'm guessing, with a minute five to go at their own five-yard line. There's only one other thing I just want to say, okay? All day, if you look at what the Jets were doing, okay, they really didn't do a lot against the Eagles' defense. And and I kept thinking to myself, now think about this strategy right now. The Philadelphia Eagles, in the first 58 minutes of this game, have given up. 236 yards, 236 yards. Their defense has been terrific. They've held the Jets to two two of 11 on third down and all that. And Miles, my only question is, does Nick Sirianni think, does he think he has a better chance at converting third and nine against a voracious Jets defense or handing the ball to his defense with the Jets, say, at their own 10-yard line or you know, what, somewhere around there, and the Jets needing 60 yards to get in decent field goal range. I just think this was a big loss by Nick Sirianni. I want your thoughts. Yeah, you know, it's funny, Peter. A lot of people are talking about the decision to either let the Jets score or not let the Jets score. But I think by going back to that third down play, that really is kind of the crux of what the issue is. Because if Jalen Hurts doesn't have the opportunity to throw the interception, then we don't even have that sort of question, right? And I would also say that even though the Jets defense is great and I don't want to take anything away from what they did or, or who they are as a unit, like that Eagles offensive line is the best in football, right? So if you're going on a run play and it is still third, nine, there is a, ch- a chance that you can convert that. I mean, if I got Jason Kelsey as my yeah. center, yeah. And I know Lane Johnson's not playing at right tackle at that point, but still you have a good chance at least of getting enough productive yards. So, hey, maybe you don't get the first down, but if it's fourth and one, then you maybe do the little tush push. And unlike Dallas, they're probably going to get it with the Eagles because that's what they do. It's a part of who they are. So, yeah, I, I think that there is something to be said for the fact that they did not run. And at the same time, I mean, if you're punting it, you're punting it to Zach Wilson, right? And he's been playing yeah. better, yes. But um, if we t- if we look at the body of work, we've not really seen him be able to get down the field that you know consistently and be able to put the Jets in good positions to win like that. It's it's interesting. You always have to not just play the analytics, but play the feel of the game, which is something to kind of go back to Monday night that Mike yeah. McCarthy was saying at the end of the first half when he let the clock run down to three seconds, called the timeout so that they could just kick a field goal instead of you know, t- calling timeout with eight seconds and then having potentially two plays, one where you, you take a shot to the end zone. So after the game, it's like, look, it was just a herky-jerky first half, and my gut feel was let's just play it safe and take the points. 
And at the end of the day, they won by yeah. three. So that's on the coach, right? You have to be able to have that kind of feel for how is the game gone? Has Jalen Hurts been playing all that well? No. Well, do we play it safe here and play so that we put it in the hands of our defense? Maybe they force a turnover. Maybe they get a sack and things. You know, you can you can do things so that in a specific situation, it makes sense for you. And, and yeah, that's where the conversation with, with what Sirianni did in that instance, I think it's interesting. Miles, we are going to come back on the other side and talk about why there are no unbeatens in the NFL after six weeks. Sort of an odd little statistical quirk. But I'll tell you why I don't think it's very odd this year. When we come back, we're going to discuss no more unbeatens. We're going to talk about the Bills, the Niners, and we're going to give some big kudos to your Detroit Lions. Well, maybe not your Detroit Lions, but I think they're about to become America's Detroit Lions. We'll be back right after this. Miles, I'll tell you why, in my opinion, there are no more unbeatens and why, in my opinion, this year is a little bit different than the average year in the NFL. I think you can look at every team in the NFL right now, even the ones that you think right now are, you know, the preeminent teams, all right? So I I think you could look at every team and you could say, man, I don't know about this. I don't know about that. Let's just take three of them. Number one, the Kansas City Chiefs. I think normally you would say Kansas City Oh, Super Bowl, uh, defending Super Bowl champions. Uh, They haven't been dominant, but they're really going to be good enough. Well, look, they have lost in the last two years two go-to receivers for Patrick Mahomes. Tyreek Hill, obviously, two years ago, and this past year, Juju Smith-Schuster. So now, this past week, they lose Justin Watson, who is their best yards per catch guy in that offense. He's not a franchise receiver. He's barely even a starting receiver uh, for, for anyone in the NFL. But I think the one thing that worries me about Kansas City is they haven't found the go-to guy aside from Travis Kelsey. And so now you look at it and you say, well, Marquez Valdez Scantling really hasn't been that guy. They want Sky Moore to be that guy. He hasn't been that guy. Rasheed Rice, maybe he'll develop into that guy, but he's only six games into his career. Uh, And and obviously Kadarius Toney has really been the same kind of inconsistent receiver that the Giants gave up on a year ago and Kansas City took for a relative song. But... I think we would say, well, geez, Kansas City by default almost is the best team. And they've got this major question mark. And it's amazing to say it's Kansas City's defense that has really Mm -hmm. been keeping them at the top of the hill. If this was a regular Kansas City defensive effort, I I don't know what would what we'd be saying right now. They might be three and three. I don't know. So I look at every team. I look at the Buffalo Bills and I wonder about the inconsistency and the penchant for, uh, you know, being this competitor who who may have gotten in a little bit of a physical confrontation during the game with the Giants. Josh Allen hurt his shoulder. We'll see if that matters over the next few weeks. But Buffalo's offense has shown clearly it's it's no sure thing. San Francisco, the injuries on a physical physical, uh, you know, team like the offense of the 49ers is. This is not an offense predicated on raw, unadulterated speed. This is a team that is predicated on playing physical and having the receivers be tough, physical guys. And obviously now with a couple of injuries on offense, that could come back to haunt them. And then Look, so then you say, well, 
What about the Miami Dolphins? They look, you know, peerless right now. And yes, the one thing I really like about the Dolphins now is that they are getting their defense up to speed with um, Vic Fangio's scheme. So their defense is playing very well. But again, I'm not asking for this. I'm not suggesting. I'm simply saying that we just don't know right now if Tua Tonga-Valoa and Tyreek Hill, who both have had signs of being nicked up over the last several years, obviously, we don't know if they can stay healthy the whole way. Um, and the last team I'll just bring up just quickly is the Detroit Lions. As I started to think about this before the show, Miles, the Lions don't have a lot of weaknesses right now. <laughs> They're playing really good on defense. They have an answer for everything on offense. Jared Goff is playing great over the last 12 months. And look, I don't mean to, you know, say this team is sort of creeping up on people, but let's think for a minute. This team is 13 and 3 in the last 16 games. That's a season, mm -hmm. you know, in essence. Well, it used to be. So, <laughs> I yeah, I don't even know if I can look at the Lions and say, well, geez, they might not be any good. So, I don't know. I look at all of these teams and I see a very big <coughs> flaw in every one of them. And that's why, as we sit here six weeks into the season, Somebody asked me today who's going to get to the Super Bowl. I say, I, yeah, I'm going to flip about seven coins. I just really have no idea. Yeah, but I, I think you have, though, named the teams that really are going to be in the mix for the Super Bowl. And, you know, I didn't necessarily expect to think this at this point. But right now, I, I feel comfortable saying that the Detroit Lions are the second best team in the NFC behind the San Francisco 49ers. I, I do. I mean, the Eagles, yeah. yeah, they've won most of their games, but they are no longer unbeaten. But, I mean, they have been flawed. Their offense has not been smooth throughout the entire course of the first, you know, third of the 2023 season. And, look, I don't – I'm not a, a guarantee guy, but I am, you know, 99.5% certain that Ben Johnson is going to have his pick of jobs in the 2024 head coaching cycle. Ben Johnson, of course, being the Lions offensive coordinator. So that's a really, really good team. And what they just did to Tampa Bay, you know, a team where Baker Mayfield comes into the game on fire on third down, and they hold them the two at 12 defensively. I mean, the, the defense in Detroit has yeah. been a liability early on in the uh, Campbell and Brad Holmes regime, and they have absolutely fixed that thing. And so when last year when Dan Campbell said Aaron Glenn is a part of the solution, clearly he is their defensive coordinator. So I, I've been really impressed by the Lions, but I agree with you. There are so many different flaws on these different teams. And I guess the one thing I would say about Kansas City is they have to be hoping that Rasheed Rice can take the steps necessary early in order to fill that role that Juju Smith-Schuster left because, I mean, yeah. they need it. They, they really need it. And you've seen yeah. flashes that Rice can kind of be that guy. He's got to start getting that ball high and tight instead of holding it like a loaf of bread so he's going to get peanut punched. But, I mean, I, I think that there are things to build upon with him um, and Patrick Mahomes in their chemistry. Just two other quick things about, about teams right now. You know, the 49ers, I think it would be easy to say about Brock Purdy, see, he wasn't that good. Um, I can't erase 13 games that I've seen with one where Brock Purdy looked terrible. Um, and he looked terrible to a large degree uh, when his weapons weren't there and when he's getting chased all over creation. You know what I found interesting? So last Sunday, I'm in the locker room after the 49ers and the Cowboys, and Trent Williams is talking about, well, let's not get that excited. We got to go to Cleveland next week, and they got one of the best football players in the league. Uh, he, he, he kept bringing up Miles Garrett, rightfully so, because Miles Garrett really had a huge impact on this game. But how amazing is it when you think about it, Miles, that 
honestly, the Cleveland Browns defense, that, that, that San Francisco played two defenses that you would think both are top five in the league in consecutive weeks. Dallas, number one, Cleveland, number two. Dallas, they just shredded from the jump. Cleveland, everything was a problem. Everything Mm -hmm. was difficult. And, And I just said to myself, it's amazing, but when you're a player and I listened, I just kept thinking of Trent Williams' words on Sunday watching that game. When you're a player, you know. We can sit on the mm-hmm. outside world and just say, well, they're going to find a way to beat Cleveland. How, you know, don't worry about it, blah, blah, blah. But <clears throat> unless you have some offensive answers uh, to that voracious front seven, and, and also the best cover corner, I, I use some next-gen numbers uh, in my column on Monday, the best cover corner in the league this year has been Denzel Ward. Mm-hmm. And and so that is those are things you really have to overcome, but and it's amazing to me, given all of that, that if Jake Moody makes a kick that he makes in his sleep, the Forty ers get back on the plane and say, "Phew, boy, survive that one." So that that and the injuries kind of worry me, obviously, about the Niners. But I think a team that I'd be a little bit more worried about. And I want to get your thoughts on the Buffalo Bills. They just do nothing easy. You know, it's a, the easiest thing they've done this year, and how crazy is this, is just totally dominate the Miami Dolphins. That's why this league is so weird. They put up 48 on the Dolphins, and they struggle to do anything against the New York Giants and make Bobby Okariki look like Dick Butkus. You know, it, it's just, it's a... That's what is so strange about this league this year, that a team like the Buffalo Bills in the span of two weeks can be so great and be so just, I don't know what word you'd call it, but what? not good. And yeah. give, me your, give, me your, give me your RX on the Buffalo Bills right now. So I'm not as concerned as I was about the Bills coming into the season as I am now, in part because of what they showed against the Miami Dolphins. And, you know, they also dismantled the Raiders. Pe- teams do that. that that's going to happen. It doesn't shock me. But I think the last two weeks have just been weird, right? You go over to London and you play a team that's been in London for 10 days Like, that's strange circumstances to play a game. And it looked like the Bills, in some ways, were sleepwalking through most of that game. Maybe they were. I mean, and, you know, people debate, like, oh, man, should you go over early? Should you go over late to London? Da-da-da-da-da. It's different for every team. And every coach might get it wrong, except for the Jaguars, because they do it every year. And so there are, if the Jaguars are already used to going over to London, and then they also have the advantage of being on the same body clock for as long as they were, I mean, that that's a weird game. And then the other thing that's weird that happened with the Bills is, I mean, who knows the Bills offensive personnel better than Brian Dable? No one. I, I, I mean, unless you're currently on the Bills coaching staff. Right. I mean, it's just, yeah. I mean, Brian Dable's walking out of the stadium with Josh Allen. That's how close those two men are. So I, I, you already have Wink Martindale, who's a great defensive schemer. You add the inside information aspect that Brian Dayball can give that team. Like that's going to be a weird one. So let's see what the bills do over the next few weeks. I mean, I'm not as concerned as I could be with them. Um, But yeah, I I just, I think that these last two games, there are a lot of unique circumstances and that's why they've looked the way they've looked. And, you know, unlike San Francisco, they can't exhale and say, Hey, we got that win. It's not pretty, but it counts the same, you know, and we can just stack it and move on, survive in advance. You know, before we get into our guest this week, Sal Palantonio, I wanted to talk about your Cleveland Browns a bit and also say a couple of words about the Detroit Lions. The Browns first. So I obviously applaud them finding a way to win a game when you're playing your third string quarterback and you're playing probably the best team in football. 
I, I applaud that. And, and believe me, I don't want to put an asterisk on this, anything like that. They won the game, great, all that. But I just keep wondering, what is the fate of these Cleveland Browns? Think about it. No matter how good a defense you are, this isn't 1976 with the Pittsburgh Steelers shutting everybody out. You just That's just not what happens in football today. And so I applaud the Browns, applaud Jim Schwartz. He's done a great job there. Miles Garrett. Um, it, it, the, this is a very, very good defense. But man, that offense, what is going to happen to them, particularly... If you've got a quarterback who, whether he plays or not, doesn't seem like he's going to be totally healthy with his rotator cuff contusion. And we don't even know if Deshaun Watson's any good anymore. So I don't know. What do you what do you see when you look at the Browns right now? I see a team that's missing Nick Chubb. And I I think when you have a running back who is that good on offense and he suffers the devastating injury that he did that early on in the season, it really, really makes things different. And it's impossible to replace a guy who is averaging over five yards a carry for his career, right? It's not just that he's really good at playing running back and, you know, what we think of running backs now and, you know, to a degree, yes, that that position is a little bit interchangeable, but when you have a guy that is truly elite, right? One of the best in the league, whether we're talking about a McCaffrey or a Derek Henry or a Chubb or Jonathan Taylor, obviously, you know, he's being paid to be one of those guys. That's the guy that's almost too hard to replace. And so if you now have a quarterback who is being paid like Deshaun Watson to win games, then Deshaun Watson's got to be able to win games when he's healthy. Um, I, I don't know if they're going to be able to do that. I really don't. I mean, if they, they're they going to be in games because that defense is so freaking good. I mean, I don't know, Peter, the last time I saw a team that already had a head coach kind of switch out a coordinator like the Browns have and the <coughs> personnel and the personality and everything just fits like a glove like Jim Schwartz has with this Cleveland defense. But – if you can't get the offense going more and on a more consistent basis, then you're not going to win more games than you lose. Because as you said, this isn't the seventies anymore. We can't just go out there and bludgeon people and think we're going to win on defensively because I mean, if you have turnovers and you give teams a short field, then they're going to be able to score. I mean, that's one of the things that's really hurt the Browns defensively is they've had short fields at times and there's a sudden change. We saw it in the Baltimore game. Boom. They score a touchdown. We saw it in the San Francisco game, sudden change interception. You know, they're deep in Cleveland territory. Boom. They score a touchdown. That's not really on the defense per se, but You know, if they're if the Browns are going to make the playoffs, you've got to start turning those things into either subsequent turnovers or at least field goals, because that offense, I I don't know how you really get to the level of consistency that you need without a Nick Chubb. Yeah, I think that's a good point. They don't have that guy who they can rely on anymore. That bothers me. I think. And there's this, we can talk about the Browns forever, but the problem is that this team is so reliant right now on whether Deshaun Watson can come back and what he's going to be like when he's come back, when he gets back. That's why, to me, the Browns are a little bit different than the Jets. Everybody would say, well, Jets have a quarterback issue and a really good defense, and the Browns have a quarterback issue and a really good defense. But I think the one thing is, when I watch the Jets play, um, even despite playing this past week and and putting up 20, which uh, was a little bit of a gift at the end of that game and putting up 20, uh, it, the one difference is I still think the Jets can do a few things on offense, whereas mm. I don't really have that faith. And, and look... It sounds crazy saying that I trust Zach Wilson over uh, even a slightly damaged Deshaun Watson. But the fact is, I have no idea what to expect out of Deshaun Watson. You keep thinking he'll be back, he'll be back. But 
and and he'll be okay. But, you know, after six games last year and then after three games this year, did you really know who Deshaun Watson was? I don't, I don't have any idea. Now he's hurt, we'll see. But that that is a weird, weird franchise to try to draw any conclusions on right now. Conversely, right now, <laughs> their rust belt. Na- the same yeah, thing right the last now. 20 years, man. <laughs> yeah. Conversely, let's talk about their rust belt neighbor, you know, which is the Detroit Lions. And I made this point in my column on Monday and, it, and I had to triple check this. But the three rust belt franchises in the NFL, Buffalo, Detroit and Cleveland, <clears throat> you know, all sort of, you know, Lake Erie buddies, I guess you would call them, okay? Those three teams, those Rust Belt teams, all won on Sunday, but they have never made the playoffs in the same season, which is really kind of crazy, isn't it? They've never, in any year in pro football, and I'm going back to the Bills in the AFL from 60 to 69, No season has ended with all three of those teams in the playoffs. And yet today, as of today, if the season ended now, you know, after six weeks, they'd all be in the playoffs. But to me, the Detroit Lions, the biggest difference is Aaron Glenn and that defense. They've done a terrific job right now. And to me, I I think they have a real chance. You talk about all these teams with weaknesses. I'm not sure the Lions, other than, you know, possibly injuries at running back right now, I'm not sure that the Lions have what I would call a screaming weakness. And, And again, you know, we'll see about David Montgomery's ability to stay on the field and to be a 250, 280 carry guy, which is what Dan Campbell really needs in this offense, but... Not a whole lot I'm worried about with the five and one Detroit Lions, Miles. Yeah, me neither. I mean, you know, you get Jamison Williams back and and boom, he makes a big, big catch deep down the field for a touchdown. I mean, that's huge. You know, I mean, you wrote about, you know, the huge blocks that they're getting in the receiving game. I'm on Ross St. Brown. Like, we're gonna have to start talking about this guy more as being one of the top receivers in the league because week after week after week, he just produces. I mean, this is a team that is, to me, a complete team. And so it's only going to be about, hey, how far can they take this? How far can they go? One thing they've got is Jared Goff as a veteran quarterback who has been in this type of situation before. Right. He's been on a stack team that everybody was talking about coming into the year. And oh my gosh, what are they going to be able to do? Well, that team in 2018 went to the Super Bowl. Now they played one of the worst games of all time in the Super Bowl. And, you know, it's a 13 to 3 game that, you know, when they play replays of of Super Bowls on NFL Network, a lot of times they'll skip over that one. But still, you know, that Jared Goff has all of that experience <laughs> built in. And I'm not I'm not joking about yeah. that. That I, I legitimately have seen that happen. But I, I think when you look at the Lions and you understand what they've done and what they've put together over the last few years with Campbell and Brad Holmes, their GM, you understand like what things can look like in the National Football League if you're actually putting a plan together, right? Everybody's talking about, oh, five-year plans. I mean, a former Panthers head coach talked about Jay-Z taking it seven years for him to get blah, blah, blah. Like, no, you've got three years really in the NFL because that's kind of how player contracts work, right? And rookie contracts, you have four years with them. Uh, If you can't start to show what you are potentially capable of doing in year two, then year three is kind of be like, man, But if you start really taking off in year three, I was like, oh, this is the way it's supposed to work. This is what it's supposed to look like. So I hope that the Detroit Lions can keep it up. I think it's great for the NFL that the Lions are good. And maybe they will finally win a a playoff game here in my lifetime because I think that would be fun to see. I think it would be fun to watch. Here's a stat for you, Miles. You talk about Amon Ross St. Brown and how we need to start talking about him. My stat on Amon Ra is this, that he now has 234 catches in his first two years and six games. So 
in order for him to get to 300 for three years. Keep in mind that his first year and a half, he's playing on a team that is very, very questionable in the passing game. But anyway, for him to get to 300, he's got to average six catches a game the rest of this year. In his career so far, he's averaged 6.2 catches a game. And all that says to me, it's a cool, nice round number. For a Detroit Lions wide receiver to come into the league and to catch 300 balls in his first three years, that is a wow to me, Mm -hmm. an absolute wow. So we're going to have fun watching the Lions the rest of the way and fun watching the connection between Jared Goff and Amon Ross St. Brown. For now, let's go to my conversation with Sal Palantonio. Obviously, he's worked for ESPN forever. Uh, I called on Sal because I wanted to do a little bit of a dissection on the Philadelphia Eagles, the team he knows better than any team in the National Football League. So here's Sal Palantonio and me. Back on the podcast now with Sal Palantonio. One of my really good friends covering the NFL over the years. And I've got so much admiration for Sal uh, for so many reasons. But Sal, I want to, before we get into the E-A-G-L-E-S, Eagles, 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 I really want people to know something about Sal Palantonio that they did not know. And I believe what people did not know about Sal Palantonio is that you were the national political correspondent at the Philadelphia Inquirer before you started covering the Philadelphia Eagles. So I want to know how that happened and what you covered and what people in the other world that you know that we don't know (laughs) that's that's a big question i'll do my best so i you know i started out as a naval officer surface warfare officer in the united states navy after i got out of college okay and i went back to my wife's hometown of albany new york and i joined the albany times union and The editor of the Albany Times Union at the time was a guy named Harry F. Rosenfeld. You know the name. He was the city editor at the Washington Post who hired Bob Woodward out of the Navy. Wow. And and he hired me uh, out of the Navy. I was never going to be Bob Woodward, but I liked politics and government. And I covered uh, Albany City government, Rensselaer County government, and uh, then the managing editor at the time was a guy named Dan Lynch who covered city politics for the Philadelphia Inquirer in the early 70s. And he helped recommend me to the Philadelphia Inquirer. So I jumped to the Inquirer and covered uh, New Jersey politics first and then came across the river to cover city politics. But in the meantime, covered uh, the presidential campaigns of 88, and 92. Wow. I never wanted to go into sports, Peter. Yeah. I I wanted to stay in covering politics and government, mostly political campaigns. I I really enjoy the political campaign. And I think football is like covering a, a political campaign. You have a strategy. There are secrets that you try to decode for the fans and, and, and in that case, yeah. the voters. And you try to find out what the opposition is doing. And then you have practice, which is basically the street campaigns. You're going out and making contacts with people and sending your message across either the airwaves or campaign house by house, street by street. And then you have an election, which is the game on Sunday. And then you do it all over on Monday. It's kind of a similar pattern, except that happens every week at the NFL level. You know, Sal, it's so interesting you you mention that, you talk about that, but 
when I went to Ohio University, I never thought that I was going to be a sports writer. I thought I'd be covering the state house in Columbus or something like that. And you know, I remember I got so inspired by uh, all the president's men, you know, the movie about Watergate um, with Bob Woodward and Dustin Hoffman. And <laughs> yeah. one of the stories, one of Robert the Robert Redford and Dustin Hoffman, right? Bob. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah. That's sorry. sorry. Yeah. Um, but one of the stories that I was able to break when I was very young in this, in this profession, uh, happened in 1988 when Lawrence Taylor, uh, was about to be suspended for four weeks for violating the NFL substance abuse policy. And I found out that he was going to be out the day before the announcement was going to come and I could not get it confirmed. But finally I spoke to somebody in the front office with the New York giants on Sunday night, this was going to get announced on Monday. And I used a Carl Bernstein trick from journalism to get this story out. And I'll tell you exactly what it was. So I said to this person who would not tell me anything, I said, hey, I hear Lawrence Taylor is going to be suspended tomorrow. This person said, I got no comment, will neither confirm or deny whatever. And so I said, well, and so we went round and around and around. And finally, I just said, listen, if you, I'm going to count to 10. And if you're still on the phone with me, by the time I get to 10, then I'm just going to assume that the story is correct, that I'm going to write tomorrow that Lawrence Taylor is about to suspended, but about to be suspended. But if that isn't true, just stop me. You know, and so I counted to 10. He didn't stop me. And at the end of it, he said, OK, you got what you need? I said, yeah. <laughs> I said, hey, thanks a lot. See you. So I wrote the story the next day. And so the story, there's a very good chance that got me hired at Sports Illustrated. And that story, quite honestly, I owe to all the president's men and Carl Bernstein. <laughs> right. That's the famous scene in the movie where Bernstein gets a White House source on the phone. It's about Bob Haldeman being in Bob charge Haldeman, of yep. Yep. And of course, they got it wrong. And they had to go back out to the guy's house to get it right. Yeah. That's a great they scene. It, they got it wrong. They got it wrong, but they were totally on the on the right track. But yeah. anyway. Yeah, that was I a, think... that's a great scene. I, I was I was inspired somewhat by that movie, but um more so just by, you know, the editors that I worked for, Rosenfeld and Lynch, you know, yeah, they the, these guys were hardcore street reporters and that's what i grew up with yeah you know i'll always think sal honestly that uh the thing that really helped me in this business is reporting about news and realizing that um you've got to have uh some tremendous curiosity and you have to really be sure uh, about stories before you write them. And look, we all in our careers, I'm sure we can all say, well, I got that wrong. I wish I had that one back, whatever. But I'll tell you, being a news reporter, I think was a tremendous help along the way to being a sports reporter. Did you find that? Yeah, there's no question about it. You have to be right before you're first. That's the rule of thumb. Yeah. If your mother says she loves you, check it out. That's the rule. Yeah, very good. Hey, so, um, Sal, I one of the reasons I really wanted to have you on this week is that uh, I was really fascinated by what I saw in the Jets-Eagles game on Sunday. And I don't want to talk necessarily just about the game, but I want to talk about the Eagles. Okay. And I thought the game was really, really interesting 
from a lot of different standpoints, but one of which was the standpoint of Jalen Hurts. And I have been overwhelmingly impressed with Jalen Hurts over the last couple of years. Uh, You know, I got to talk to him a few times. I, in no way would I ever say that I know him because I don't. Um, But I've talked to him a few times, obviously watched him, uh, talked to Nick Sirianni a lot about him. And I've been totally impressed with him. But at the end of that game uh, against the Jets, when he threw the interception to Tony Adams that led to New York scoring the winning touchdown. Uh, It was very interesting. The TV cameras focused on him on the sidelines probably three or four times for an extended period each time. And he looked, I, I mean, it might be too strong a word to say he looked defeated, but he looked different than I've seen him on the sidelines after, you know, late in games or during games where he's looking at the tablet or he's engaging with coaches, whatever. Um, he really seemed to be affected by that game against the Jets and by that loss. You were there. You were on the scene. What did you see? What did you feel? Well, I think it manifested itself. After the game, I think you're right. I think it did have an impact on him that was different, Peter. And you could see it on his face. And after the game, before Nick Sirianni said a word to the team, the locker room doors are closed. Nick Sirianni doesn't say anything, doesn't have a chance to say anything. And Jalen Hurts gets up in front of his teammates and says, it's on me. Takes full accountability for what happened in the game. Uh, that, uh, for in my, for my knowledge, I don't, I don't ever remember that happening in the Jalen Hurts Nick Sirianni era. Right. So, so that that was very telling. And then AJ Brown spoke, and uh, some other players. But you know, those are the two offensive leaders, AJ Brown and Jalen Hurts. And I think you're right. I think it did have an impact on him, but. I think there's so many things about that game, so many dynamics, big and little, that are important to talk about when you're talking about a team that's trying to get back to the Super Bowl after losing a Super Bowl, which, as we know, is very hard to do. You were in training camp. You may have been there the day that Nick Sirianni said that the metrics and the analytics that they looked at in the offseason – they have a very big analytics department and they looked and looked and looked and investigated what are the factors that really impact a team not getting back to the Super Bowl. And there are two of them. And they're not tough to figure out. Number one is a fall off in offensive production. And number two is injuries. And the Eagles have been victimized by both of those things and they sometimes go hand in hand you know th- they were not going to go 17 and 0 right but, but what happened yesterday i think is indicative of this trend that sort of bugs teams that are trying to get back to the super bowl there were eight starters of the 22 that started the season that weren't on the field at the end of that game most important the right tackle, Lane Johnson. Now, you and I sit in the Hall of Fame selection committee room every year. You've been there for three decades. I've been there for one. Um, Lane Johnson is, to me, the Mariano Rivera of right tackles. So since he started with the Philadelphia Eagles, when he's in the starting lineup, their winning percentage is 631. When he's not in the starting lineup, their winning percentage drops to 360, which is amazing. That is amazing. Yeah. I mean, we like Jack Driscoll. We think he's a good player, but we're talking about a guy who's probably going to Canton in Lane Johnson. And I think, you know, he was on Jalen Hurts was under more pressure than he was all of last season in this, in this game. I think, Robert Sala did a great job and the rest of that defensive staff 
of mixing in different coverages and blitzes. They fooled Jalen Hurts, obviously, on the last interception. Kudos to Tony Adams and a great job by the staff. But in the end, you know, they were trying to help Jack Tristel on the right side when Lane Johnson went down in the four, in the first quarter, and that was not good enough, and he was constantly under pressure, and you could see it. Dan Orlovsky did a really good job of breaking it down on Get Up this morning on ESPN with Mike Greenberg talking about his body language in the pocket, how his shoulders and head were slumped, and how he was drifting in the pocket as a result of the pressure. You know, you it, you, you get weird, worn down when you get hit and under pressure. Yeah. You, you just do. But again, they weren't going to go 17 and 1. Uh, they got to get healthier and uh, they've They've got to get more productive on offense. Do you think there is anything else that when you watch the Eagles right now that I don't even want to say alarms you, but that you think is concerning to you as you see them try to make another run toward a Super Bowl? Pass defense for sure. They've had a rash of injuries in the secondary so far. They've been able to hold up okay. But, you know, uh, Zach Wilson's not Patrick Mahomes. He's not Josh Allen. He's not Brock Purdy. And they still have some really difficult games up ahead. Uh, Seattle, Geno Smith, that, that offense is definitely more potent than the Jets. So they've had some injuries in the secondary. You know, they lost their number one slot corner, Avante Maddox, to a bicep injury for the season. He may be one of the best slot corners in the NFL. He's definitely in the top five or six, and he's gone. And they tried the experiment of moving Bradbury in. They signed Bradley Roby, who's a a competent player, a good player, an experienced player, a tough player. Um, But Avante Maddox was a difference maker. Jalen Carter wasn't on the field. And Jalen Carter was their number one disruptor in the interior defensive line. Uh, These are explanations and excuses, but the bottom line is, Peter, you look at at the stat sheet, and I did this on SportsCenter last night. The Eagles had more first downs in the game, more total net yards, more passing yards, more gross passing yards. I mean, it's not even close. They had half as many penalties as the Jets. They gave the game away with four turnovers. Yeah. So Yeah, I think I think so. I'm I'm you know, when I watch them now, I watched a you know, last year toward the end of the year and I'm thinking about particularly the Giants game in the playoffs. Uh, and in the Super Bowl, and and obviously somewhat also against the 49ers, this team was unstoppable on offense. And I think what I what I what I miss seeing right now on offense is that great confidence that they had, and the great confidence that I had in them uh, as they were going through it. And again, look. Bill Parcells had a famous saying every year when he get to training camp, he would say, you never pick up one year, positive or negative, where you left off the previous year. So every year is a new year. You've got to come out and play great that year. No one is thinking about what you did last January. And so that's what I think of when I watch the Eagles now, that they've got a battle to get back to where they were in the last three or four games last season. That's sort of how I see it. You know, and that confidence starts with their offensive line. And they're missing both their right tackle and right guard, starting right tackle and right guard. You know, Jalen Hurts coming into the game against the Jets, Peter, was already the most blitz quarterback in the NFL, 41% of the time. Wow. So – the way they were defeating the blitz was superior offensive line play. You couldn't rush four against the Eagles because if you did, 
the offensive line would hold up. You had to come after him. Once Lane Johnson went out of the game on Sunday, then it was open season with Robert Sala's defense. They only yeah. they yeah. only blitz 19% of the time, the Jets. They rush for 81% of the time and expect to hold up on the back end or at least, you know, through deception, get to you. And once Johnson went out and they just opened up the floodgates and they were after Jalen Hurts. And that was the real difference maker to me in the game for sure. Now Miami, they also don't blitz that much. But Miami's got a track meet. Yeah. And the Eagles have to, you know, figure out what they're going to do in their secondary because, you know, McDaniel doesn't have to scheme up very much. I know he re- I realize he he learned from Kyle uh, and they they have a sophisticated running game. But when you can beat one-on-one matchups continually with nine routes like they yeah. did the last two, three games, this is a big test for the Eagles secondary now in this game against Miami. Yeah. So going into this game, and I want to turn it to the Jets after this, but going into this game, I think the interesting part is that You know, the Eagles now, I mean, I always thought that last year the Eagles pass offense had a huge edge over uh, the foes that they played. And that's how it turned out during the year. But this year, it's almost it's almost even. In fact, you know, the you know, if anything, the opposition is getting better production, 11 touchdown passes two interceptions versus for the Eagles, seven and seven Mm -hmm. Uh, better passer rating for the opponents than the Eagles have this year. But look, a lot of this is, as you say, because, you know, their offensive line has been in flux and now you may have to play a game or two or however many without Lane Johnson. And, you know, and obviously that's going to be an issue. But look, every great team has to deal with injuries and has to deal with adversity. And to have the Miami Dolphins coming in and knowing that if you're on the offense now, if you're Jalen Hurts approaching this game, honestly, you know, he has got to be thinking, I got to score in the 30s for us to have a really good chance to win this game because Miami's going to score in the 30s, you know, against almost anybody. So I, I think I think this is a great, fun, very interesting matchup. And and Sal, as somebody who lives in Philadelphia and who has watched the Philadelphia Phillies take advantage of a gigantic home field advantage in the baseball playoffs. I always think that if you see a game at Citizens Bank Park or a Lincoln Financial Field, that that has to mean something. You've covered a thousand games over the years there. You've been to a thousand sports events in Philly Tell me if you can what it means to the opposing team to have that crowd in the game the way it is. Well, all you have to do is look at the face of the Braves shortstop who was getting worn out in the dugout by the Phillies fans. That tells you everything you need to know. You know, Peter, when you come to Lincoln Financial Field, you stand in the visitor's tunnel. I always go to the visitor's tunnel. I want to hear what the fans are saying to those visiting players as they're coming on and off the field. You know, we don't roll the camera because we can't put any of it on television. (laughs) There's no sense in rolling the camera. Where are we going to play it? Yeah. But I want to hear it and I want to feel it because it's, it's, um, you know, it's rough. Yeah. It's rough. It's passionate. You know, uh, Rob Thompson was quoted recently as saying 
he talked to another major league manager who told him going to Citizens Bank ballpark is like three hours of pure hell. <laughs> I and really like that. It, it really is. And, you know, yeah. and the fans are knowledgeable, passionate, tough, unforgiving, and uh, loyal. So loyal. You got to yeah. remember the Phillies were the only franchise in North America to have 10,000 losses in the 20th century. God. And you got to realize the Eagles watched 12 Super Bowl titles in the NFC East before they won one. And wow. yet the Lincoln Financial Field, the PSL sold out instantaneously. The place is always packed. Phillies fans never gave up always show up. They show up with their time and their money while they open their wallets yeah. and, and, and they pass it down from generation to generation. You know, like Boston, for sure. It's not like yeah. New York, you know, because New York has two teams for every sport. It's more, it's, a, it's, it's like Boston. Yeah. Sal, let's say two things about the New York Jets. So, okay. I was, I was really impressed with the Jets' performance in this game. And clearly, that is one oppressive defense. That defensive front seven is so good and so pressure-packed that they were able to make up for the loss of the top three corners that they have you know, on their team, which they didn't find out they were going to be missing them until Friday and Saturday – uh, of 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 the game week. Give me your impression watching the Jets of whether they might be able to hold it together and make a playoff run. I I would invite anybody, including you, to just watch the Jets defense on tape. Go back and just look at the Jets defense and watch number 56, Quincy Williams. Yeah. He personifies ferocity, speed, power, and 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 just ferocious play. Yeah, and you know, so Robert Sala said that Aaron Rodgers' superpower is his presence. Well, Robert Sala is not giving himself enough credit. I arrived yesterday at MetLife Stadium on Sunday at MetLife Stadium for a 425 game at 8 a.m. because I was live on one of our shows at 9 a.m. Robert Sala began running the steps at MetLife Stadium by himself at 9 a.m. Think about that, Peter. That's seven hours, seven and a half hours before kickoff. So we get done with our live shots. We go up to the press box. We have one more hit at around, I think it was like 11, 11.30. Salah's in round two of doing the steps, lower bowl. Didn't want to just do one. Did another one. And the, I think his superpower is the way he just has so much energy. He comes yeah. to the stadium with so much energy gets on the sideline and delivers energy he's yeah. it's like he's one of the players and the players feed off of that i mean he's part architect i get it his d coordinator is a very good d coordinator but the way he engages the players the first guy i went to after the game to interview wasn't Zach Wilson. It wasn't Brees Hall. It was CJ Mosley. You know, it's an old trick I used to go after Bart Scott. Remember the Bart Scott interview? Yeah, always go, yeah. always go for the linebackers because they have, they have that adrenaline still coursing through their veins. It, it, you know, it, it takes a while for it really to subside. You want to get that energy on camera. So I go to CJ Mosley and I said, "You were the one who said it before the game." that if we're going to go anywhere, we got to start beating teams like this. And then he just went off. 
And I think that a lot of that comes from Robert Sala. I think his superpower is the energy he brings to that stadium, to that field, to that team, especially on defense. You that's have more, a, that's uh, probably more than you wanted, Peter. But oh, that's it was opinion. good. It was a good scene. Do you have a a gut feeling or any opinion whatsoever on the state of Aaron Rodgers' rehab and whether he might be able to play football before the end of this season? Here's my observation. You know Aaron Rodgers better than I do. You've interviewed him many more times than I have. My view from afar is that Aaron Rodgers is different than when he was in Green Bay. That he is engaged on a personal level in a way that he was not there. And that's not to say that he wasn't. I think he's just turned up the heat, turned up the volume of it, turned up the intensity. The engagement is there. You can see it with the players. Him just being on the sideline, throwing before the game on the field, you know, it was snap, crackle, pop, baby. It was real. You know, it was, you could feel it. The buzz, he got on the field and the reporters left the press box and everybody went over to take pictures. You know, it was like Paul McCartney walked out on the field with a guitar. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I, I've talked to a couple of people uh, in the medical fraternity who say that, look, it should be, should be, very, very unlikely that you can come back in less than five months from an Achilles. But they say two things. Number one, Dr. Neil Elitrash is really cutting edge guy on a lot of surgeries, a lot of orthopedic surgeries. And so if anybody is going to come up with a way to expedite that process, it'd be him. And I think the second thing is, I forget the name of the exact procedure, but in most uh, Achilles tears, what the surgeon will do is he will reattach the Achilles and basically it'll be like the, the number one, you know, it'll be, it'll be one piece and it will be attached like that. Well, imagine that there is an X. Okay like a narrow X. And that is how Dr. Neil Ella Trash attached the Achilles to Aaron Rodgers, which means that there are now four sutures, okay? Two on the top, two on the bottom that they used to reattach his Achilles. And look, I'm not saying that it's going to mean anything because I don't know. All I know is that 32 days after he had this surgery, Aaron Rodgers was walking without a boot, walking without crutches, and throwing a football fairly normally. So you ask yourself, okay, if he does that in one month, what about three months? What happens? Could he play week 17, week 18? And again, I am in no way suggesting he will. I am just suggesting that I don't think it's impossible, and we'll see. No, I don't think it's impossible. Um, but I'm not going to sit here and, you know, conjecture about his medical right. condition. I just – I'm not qualified, don't know what's happening really behind the scenes right. with him and his doctor. Yeah, have no idea. What I'm – what I'm suggesting to you is that just by being there, he's definitely having an impact on the football team. And yeah. that's and that's an important part for him to play. And I think a lot of it de- it will be determined, in my opinion, my opinion only, about whether he gets back on the field, about is he needed? Right? Is he needed? Can he make a difference? Uh you know, it's it's one thing to walk around and 
throw a football. It's another thing to get out of the way of the rush. Yes. Agreed. <clears throat> yep. So we'll see. I wish him the best. I hope he gets back as soon as possible. And uh, I hope he gets back to playing at a high level. It's good for everybody if he does. The Jets, Aaron Rodgers, the people who watch football, the people who cover football, it's good for everybody. No question about it. Sal Palantonio, listen, thanks so much for taking time. Really appreciate it. Love watching you. Love uh, your knowledge. And thanks so much for enriching my podcast this week. Peter, thanks for having me. It's really been a pleasure. And, uh, you know, your friendship means so much to me. Thank you. Well, Miles, I want your last word on Miami at Philadelphia, Sunday night, the game of the week in the NFL. Who you got? How can, how can you not be excited for this one, Peter? I mean, you're not excited for this. And you don't love football. It's going to be a football. great game. I mean, come on. You got the, you know, last year's NFC champions against a team that Wink Martindale called the supersonic greatest show on turf. I mean, this is going to be fun. I mean, the, the, the Philadelphia defense has performed well over the course of this season. We get to see Tua Tungavailoa and Tyreek Hill in prime time, Jalen Waddle, all those great weapons that they've got over there in Miami. It's going to be a showcase game for the league. We'll see if Jalen Hurts can bounce back. You know with his competitive spirit he wants to. I, I am certainly going to be waiting all day for Sunday night uh, this weekend. I kind of like the Dolphins in this game. Yeah. Uh, and one of the reasons I like him is that I think Tua Tongavaloa has now figured out uh, when to get rid of it, when to fight another battle. And I think he's going to do that at Lincoln Financial Field. I don't think he's going to have incredible numbers. I think he's going to make enough plays against a team that, you know, on that defense right now, uh, or I'm sorry, on that Philadelphia offense, I just don't know who to trust right now. Mm. I think, uh, you know, until Sunday, I was telling everybody Jalen Hurts will be fine. Man, you know, like Sal and I discussed in that in that little segment, uh, you know, Jalen Hurts at the end of that game is staring into space saying, what in the world is going on here? So I think as we record this on Tuesday, I will guarantee you, it's Tuesday morning, I will guarantee you that Jalen Hurts is in the facility. He's probably working out right now, but all afternoon he's going to be wondering, watching tape, talking, sticking his head into Nick Sirianni's room, into the offensive staff's room, and basically say, hey, here's what I see, what do you see? And I think this is a big, big test because, look, the Eagles are going to have to score some points. They haven't mm -hmm. been a point-scoring machine so far. Yeah. So I love this game. I like the Dolphins in it, but nothing will surprise me. Miles Simmons, thanks so much for joining me. You're doing overtime. You had a heck of a day. You were at the uh, football game on Monday night at SoFi. You wake up early Monday morning. You do the PFT show at 4 a.m. your time, and then you do this podcast. You my friend, are a horse. And you are just doing the job and getting the job done. And I just want to thank you for always being there for this podcast and being a great uh, soldier for NBC. Well, thank you, sir. Hey, it's my pleasure. There are a lot worse things that I could be doing than covering football and getting to talk about it, man. I, I love it. Miles Simmons, thank you, and thanks to everyone for listening to this episode and for experiencing, if you're on NBC Sports' YouTube page, this episode of the Peter King Podcast. And we will be looking for you again next week after Week 7 in the National Football League. Have a great week, everyone. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.